everybody. How is everyone doing? Captions working. Speak microphone making wavy lines. We are doing a stream. It's been a while. I wasn't sure if I remembered how to do this. Uh, but welcome to uh, your lunch break with one bookshelf. Today we are doing story time. And if this is your first time joining us, this is the most chill of all of our already pretty laid back streams. I'm going to be reading some fiction from Drive Through Fiction, which is our marketplace for goodness, fiction, but also there's lots of other cool stuff. Um, uh, like I know there's lots of like tarot books and stuff that I'm interested in. Anyway, today we are reading New Sons, original speculative fiction by people of color. This is my favorite genre of fiction. So I am excited for some fresh takes on spec fic. It is an anthology by Rebellion Publishing, which I'm seeing on the product page makes a lot of very cool sci-fi, fantasy, and other anthologies. Like there's one called Shine, an anthology of optimistic science fiction. And science fiction is often very, um, uh, I don't want to say depressing, but I guess that is kind of what I mean. It's the best word I have right now. Science fiction is often like it feels like warnings a lot of times. So I'm very excited about the optimistic science fiction. Maybe we can check that out next time. Scott, Scott's got the word dystopian. Yeah, um, but it'll be interesting to see what tone of stories we get today. I'm not going to read the whole anthology. That would be so much. Uh, but I think we'll have time for like three or so stories. Let's start off, though. I'll read the product description for everybody so you know what lovely treat we are in for. So this is New Suns. It won the 2020 Locus World Fantasy and Ignite Awards. So we're definitely in for some good stuff. There's nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns, proclaimed Octavia E. Butler. New Sons, original speculative fiction by people of color, showcases emerging and seasoned writers of many races, telling stories filled with shocking delights, powerful visions of the familiar made strange. Between this book's covers burn tales of science fiction, fantasy horror, and their indefinable overlappings. These are authors aware of our many possible pasts and futures, authors freed of stereotypes and cliches, ready to dazzle you with their daring genius. Unexpected brilliance shines forth from every page. That sounds so good. I'm so hype. Uh, the, so I downloaded this and it is available as an EPUB and Mobi, which is a Kindle file. Um, I, I am relatively new. I usually download PDFs. So in case you are like me and you're like, oh no, what do I do with this file? All you have to do is download an EPUB reader. And I downloaded a free option, which was very easy for me to figure out called Cal Libra. Um, uh, the, it's C-A-L-I-B-R-E. Uh, since I'm seeing the web captioner, I did not spell it quite correctly. So how about, I'm probably going to start with the first story in the anthology, uh, but then from there, we can totally jump around. So the first one is called The Galactic Tourist Industrial Complex by Tobias S. Buckle. But how about I read out a few titles that are of interest to me, just based on the title, which is really doesn't mean anything, but I'm just looking at the table of contents right now. Uh, and if anything jumps out at you, let me know and we'll read those next. Um, or I can read all the titles. Yeah. Okay. So it's Dear Dancer, The Virtue of Unfaithful Translations. That one sounds really cool. Come Home to Atropos, The Fine Print, Unkind of Mercy, Burn the Ships, the Freedom of the Shifting Sea. Three variations on a theme of imperial attire. I'm curious what exactly that story is based on that title alone. 
blood and bells. Give me your black wings, O oh sister. Ooh. The shadow we cast through time. The robots of Eden. Dumb house. One easy trick. Harvest. And then the last one is Kelsey and the burdened breath. So let's start with our first one. If any of those titles jumped out at you and you really want to know more about the story based off those titles, we can read that one next. Just let me know in the live chat. Okay. The Galactic Tourist Industrial Complex by Tobias S. Buckle. When Galactics arrived at JFK, they often reeked of ammonia, sulfur, and something else the Tavi could never quite put a finger on. He was used to it all after several years of shuttling them through the outer tanks and waiting for their gear to spit ozone and adapt to Earth's air. Let's move this reader over here. Okay. He would load luggage, specialized environmental adaptation equipment, and cross-check the being's needs, itinerary, and sightseeing goals. What he wasn't expecting this time was for a 400-pound octopus-like creature to open the door of his cab a thousand feet over the new Brooklyn Bridge, filling the cab with an explosion of cold, screaming air and lighting the dash up with alarms. He, would de he also definitely wasn't expecting the alien to scream, look at those spires, through a speaker that translated for it. So for a long moment after the alien jumped out of the cab, Tavi just kept flying straight ahead, frozen in shock at the controls. This couldn't be happening. Not to him, not in his broken down old cab he'd been barely keeping going, and with a re-up on the Manhattan license due soon. To fly into Manhattan, you needed a permit. That was the first thing he panicked about, because he'd recently let it lapse for a bit. The New York Tourism Bureau hadn't just fined him, but suspended him for three months. Tavi had limped along on some odd jobs, tank cleaning at the airport, scrubbing out the backs of the cabs when they came back after a run to the island and other muck work. But no, all his licenses were up to date, and he knew that it was a horrible thing to worry about as he circled the water near the bridge. He should be worrying about his passenger. Maybe this alien was able to withstand long falls, Tavi thought. Maybe, but it wasn't coming up. He had a contact card somewhere in the dash screen's memory. He tapped, calling the alien. Please answer, please. But it did not pick up. What did he know about the alien? It looked like some octopus type thing. What did that mean? They shouldn't have even been walking around, so it had to have been wearing an exoskeleton of some kind. Could that have protected it? Tavi circled the water once more. He had to call this in, but then the police would start hassling him about past mistakes. Somehow this would be his fault. He would lose his permit to fly in Manhattan, and it was Manhattan that the aliens loved above all else. This was the real American experience, even though most of it was heavily built up with zones for varying kinds of aliens. Methane breathers in the garment district, the buildings capped with translucent covers, and an alien atmosphere. Hydrogen types were all north of Central Park. He found the sheer number of shops fun to browse, but few of them sold anything of use to humans. In the beginning, a lot of researchers and scientists had rushed there to buy what the Galactics were selling. Sure, they could reverse engineer what they found. Turned out, it was a lot of cheap alien stuff that purported to be made in Earth but wasn't. Last year, some government agency purchased a real human sports car that could be shipped back to the home planet of your choice. It had an engine inside that seemed to be some kind of anti-gravity device that got everyone really excited. It exploded when they cracked the casing, talking about taking out several city blocks. When confronted about it, the tall, furry, sauropod-like aliens that had several other models in their windows on Broadway shrugged and said it wasn't made by them. They just shipped them to Earth to sell. But Galactics packed the city buying that shit when they weren't slouching beside the lake in Central Park. If Tavi couldn't get to Manhattan, he didn't have a job. With a groan, Tavi tapped 911. There was going to be a lot of questions. He was going to be in it up to his neck. But if he took off... They'd have his transponder on file. Then he'd look guilty. 
With a faint clenching in his stomach, Tavi prepared for his day to go wrong. Tavi stood on a pier, wearing a gas mask to filter out the streams of what seemed like mustard gas that would seep out from a nearby building in Dumbo. The cops, also wearing masks, took a brief statement. Tavi gave his fingerprint, and then they told him to leave. Just leave? There were several harbor patrol boats hovering near where the alien had struck the water, but there was a lack of urgency to it all. Mostly everyone seemed to be waiting around for something to happen. The cop, taking Tavi's statement, wore a yellow jumpsuit with logos advertising a financial district casino. Risk your money here, just like they used to in the old stock market. Win big. Ring the old bell. He nodded through his gas mask as he took notes. We have your contact info on file. We're pulling footage now. But aren't you going to drag the river? Go. There was something in the cop's tone that made it through the muffled gas mask and told Tavi it was in order. He'd done the right thing in an impossible moment. He'd done the right thing, right? He wanted to go home and take a nap, draw the shades and huddle in the dark and make all this go away for a day. But there were bills to pay. The cab required insurance and the kinine fuel it used shipped down from orbit wasn't cheap. Every time the sprinklers under the cab missed it up and put down a new layer, Tavi could hear his bank account dropping. But you couldn't drive on the actual ground into Manhattan, not if you wanted to get a good review. Plus, the ground traffic flow licenses were even more whack than flying licenses because the, in because the interstellar tourists didn't want to put up with constant traffic snarls. Trying to tell anyone that traffic was authentic old Manhattan just got you glared at. So, four more fares. More yellowed gas mixing into the main cabin of the cab, making Tavi cough and his eyes water. The last batch, a pack of wolf-like creatures that poured into the cab, chittering and yapping like squirrels, requested he take them somewhere serving human food. Real human food, not that shit engineered to look like it, but doctored so that our systems can process it. Tavi's dash had lit up with places the Taurus Bureau authorized for this pack of aliens that kept grooming each other as he watched them in his mirror. Yeah, okay. He took them to his cousin Geoff's place up in Harlem, which didn't have as many skyscrapers bubble-wrapped with alien atmospheres. The pack creatures were oxygen breathers, but they supplemented that with something extra running to their noses in tubes that occasionally wheezed and puffed a dust of cinnamon-smelling air. Ooh, I like that, cinnamon-smelling. Tavi wanted some comfort food pretty badly by this point. While the aliens tried to make sense of the really authentic human menus out front, he slipped into the hot, gleaming, stainless steel of the kitchens in the back. Ricky, Geoff shouted, you bring those dogs in? Yes, Tavi confessed, and Geoff gave him a half hug, his dreadlocks slapping against Tavi. Maybe they'll tip you a million. Shit, maybe they'll tip you a trillion. It was an old service job joke. How much did it cost across the galaxy to put your own eyes or light receptors on a world just for the sake of seeing it yourself? Some of the aliens who had come to Earth had crossed distances so great, traveled in ships so complicated, that they spent more than a whole country's GDP. A tip from one of them could be millions. There were rumors of such extravagances. A dish boy turned rich suddenly. A tour guide with a place built on the moon. But the Tourism Bureau and the galactic-owned companies bringing the tourists had warned them not to overpay for services. The Earth was a fragile economy, they said. You didn't want to just run around handing out tips worth a year of some individual's salary. You could create accidental inflation or unbalanced power in a neighborhood. So the apps on the tourist systems, whatever types of systems they used, knew what the local exchange rates were and paid folks down here on the ground proportionally. Didn't stop anyone from wishing, though. Geoff slid him over a plate of macaroni pie, some peas and rice and chicken. Tavi told him about his morning. You shouldn't have called the police, Geoff said. And what, just keep flying? The Bureau will blacklist you. They have to save face, and no one is going to want to hear about a tourist dying on the surface. It's bad publicity. You're going to lose your license into Manhattan. New York City's Bureau is the worst, man. Tavi cleaned his fingers on a towel, then coughed. The taste of cinnamon came up with s strong through his throat. You okay? Tavi nodded, eyes watering. Whatever the pack out there was sniffing, it was ripping through his lungs. You need to be careful. Oh, God, I just, oh, I lost his accent. We're just going to talk normal, okay, everyone? 
<laughs> you need to be careful, Geoff said. Get a better filter in the cab. Nichelle's father got lung cancer off a bunch of shit coming off the suits of some sun divers last year. Doctors couldn't do nothing for him. I know. <laughs> I know, Tavi said between coughs. Geoff handed him a bag with something rolled up in aluminum foil inside. Rody for the road. Chicken. No bone. I have doubles if you want. No, Geoff was being too nice. He knew how Tavi was climbing out from a financial hole and had been bringing by quote-unquote extras after he closed up each night. Most of the food here was for non-human tourists, variations on food that wouldn't upset their unique systems. Tavi had lied in taking the tourist pack here. The food out front was for the dog-like aliens, but the stuff in the bag was real, something Geoff made for folk who knew to come in through the back. Tavi did one more run back to JFK, and this time he flew a few loops around the megastructure. JFK Interspatial was the foot of a leg that stretched up into the sky, piercing the clouds and rising beyond until it reached space. It was a pier that led to the deep water where the vast alien ships that moved tourists from star to star docked. It was the pride of the U.S. Congress had financed it by pledging the entire country's GDP for a century to a galactic building consortium. So no one really knew how to build another after it was done. But the promise was that increased Manhattan tourism would bring in jobs. Because with the Galactics shipping in things to sell here in exchange for things they wanted, there wasn't much in the way of industrial capacity. Over half the U.S. economy was tourism. The rest? Service jobs. Down at the bottom of JFK, the eager vacationers and sightseers disgorged into terminals designed for their varying biologies and then were kitted out for time on Earth. Or like Tavi's latest customer, just bundled into a can that slid into the back of a cab and that was then dropped off at one of the hotels dwarfing Manhattan's old buildings. When the drop off of the tourist in a can that Tavi couldn't see or interact with was done, he headed home. That took careful flying over the remains of LaGuardia, which pointed off from Brooklyn toward the horizon, the way it had ever since it collapsed and fell out of stable orbit. Land around LaGuardia remains was cheap, and Tavi lived in an apartment complex roofed by the charred chunk of the once space elevator's outer shell. Home sweet home, he said, coming in for landing. There was a burning smell somewhere in the back of the cab. Smoke started filling the cabin and the impellers failed. He remained in the air, the canine, the canine misters doing their job and preventing him from losing neutral buoyancy and coasted. Tavi wanted to get upset, hit the wheel, punch the dash, but he just bit his lip as the car finally stopped just short of the roof's parking spot. He had the misters spray some cancellation foam, and the car dropped a bit too hard to a stop. At least you got home, Sienna said, laughing as he opened the doors to the cab and stumbled out. You know what I think of this galactic piece of shit. It gets the job done. Sienna poked her head into the cab, holding her breath. Her puffy hair bobbed against the side of the hatch. Can you fix it? He asked her. It was one of the dog things with the cinnamon breath. That gas they breathe catalyzes the O-rings. You need to spend some money to isolate the shaft back here. Next big tip, Tavi told her. She crawled back out and let out the breath she'd been holding. Okay, next big tip. I can work on it if you split dinner with me. She nodded at the bag Geoff had given him. Sure. There's also a man waiting by your door. Looks like tourist bureau? Shit. He didn't want anyone from the bureau out here, not in an illegal squat of the ruins of the space elevator now draped across the side of the world. There was no air conditioning. The solar panels lashed to the scrap hull rooftop didn't pump out enough juice to make that a reality. But the motion-sensitive fans kicked on and the LED track lights all leapt to attention as Tavi led the beat-faced tourist bureau agent through the mosquito netting. The agent, David Kahn, had a tight haircut and glossy brown skin, the kind that meant he didn't spend much time outside loading aliens into the back of cabs. He had an office job. Sienna will fix it. She grew up a scrapper. Her father was one of the original decommissioners paid to work on picking LaGuardia up before the contract was canceled and they all decided to stay put. Beer? Tavi passed him a sweaty red stripe from the fridge, which Khan held nervously in one hand as if he wanted to refuse it. Instead, he placed it against his forehead. The man had been waiting a while in the heat, and he was wearing a heavy suit. 
So I'm here. Oh, I keep trying to like put in New York accents. Speak normal, Lisa. You can't keep it up. Okay. So I'm here to offer you a grant from the Greater New York Bureau of Tourism, Khan started, sounding a little unsure of himself. A grant? The Bureau is starting to moder the Bureau is starting a modernization campaign to make sure our cabs are the safest on earth. That means we'd like to take your cab in and have it retrofitted with better security, improved impellers, better airlocks, for the driver's safety. The driver? Of course. Tavi thought it was a line of bullshit. Human lives were cheap. There were billions teeming away on the planet. If Tavi ever stepped out, someone else would bid on his license to Manhattan and he'd be forgotten in days, maybe even hours. Take it, Sienna said, pushing through the netting. That piece of shit needs any help it can get. Tavi didn't have to be told twice. He put his thumb to the documents, verbally repeated assent into a tiny red dot of a light, and then Khan said a tote truck was on its way. They watched the cab get lifted onto its back, the patchwork of a vehicle that Tavi had come to know every smelly inch of. What about the dead alien? Tavi asked. Well, according to the documents you just signed, you can never talk about the, er, incident again. I get it. Tavi waved a salute at the disappearing cab and tow truck. I figured as much when you said you had a grant. But what happens to the alien? Did you ever find the body? Khan let out a deep breath. We found it. Downstream of where it jumped. Why the hell did it do that? Why jump out? It was out of its mind on vacation drugs. Cameras show the party started in orbit with a few friends, continued down the JFK elevator all the way to the ground. When do you send the body back to its people? We don't. Khan looked around, surprised. No one wants to know a high-profiled cephaloid of any kind has died on Earth. So they didn't. The video of the fall no longer exists in any system. But they can track the body, already fired off via an old-school rocket aimed at our sun. That leaves no evidence here. Nothing happened on Earth. Nothing happened to you. Khan shook hands with Sienna and Tavi and left. The next morning, a brand new cab was parked on the roof. Easier than scrubbing it all down for DNA, Sienna said. The old one's probably on a rocket as well, just like the body, being shot towards the sun as we speak. He scrambled up some eggs for his ever-hungry roomie and some extra for the Araji brothers next door. There were 30 other random chumps of real and fa- random clumps of real and found families living in welded together scrap here. Several of them watched the sun creep over the rusted wreckage scattered from the horizon to horizon as they ate breakfast. Tavi would head back into the drudgery of flying tourists around. Sienna would work at, at trying to pry something valuable out of the ruins. Just as they finished eating, a second cab descended from the clouds. It kicked up some dust as it settled in on the ground. Hey, asshole, Sienna shouted. If we all land on metal, we don't kick dust into everyone's faces. Grumbling assent rose into the morning air. The door slid open, and Tavi felt his stomach drop. Oh no. Another octopus-like alien stood on the ground looking up at them. I'm looking for the human named Tavi, the speaker box on the exoskeleton buzzed. Is he here? Don't say a thing, Sienna hissed. Sienna, who had all the smarts built up from a lifetime of eat or be eaten while scavenging in the wreckage. I'm Tavi, Tavi said, stepping down toward the alien. You're an idiot, Sienna said. She walked off toward the shadows under a pile of scrap and disappeared. The alien crouched in a spot of shade, trying to stay out of the sun, occasionally rubbing sunscreen over its photosensitive skin. I'm the co-sponsor of the unit last seen in your vehicle when it came down to your planet for sightseeing. Tavi felt his stomach fall out from under him. Oh, he said numbly. He wasn't sure what a co-sponsor was or why the alien's language had been translated that way. He had the feeling this alien was a close friend or maybe even family member of the one he'd witnessed jump to its death. No one will tell me anything. Your representatives have done nothing but flail around and throw bureaucratic ink my way, the alien tourist said. I'm really sorry for your loss, Tavi said. So you are my last try before offensers get involved, the alien concluded. Offensers? The alien used one of its mechanized limbs to point up. A shadow passed over the land. Something vast skimmed over the clouds and blocked the sun. It hummed, 
and the entire land hummed back with it. Somehow Tarvi knew that whatever was up there could destroy a planet. Tavi's wristband vibrated. Incoming call. Khan. The world was crashing into him. Tavi felt it all waver for a moment, and then he took a deep breath. All I wanted to do was the right thing, he muttered, and took the call. Very big alien destroyers, David Khan said in a level but clearly terrified voice. We at the Greater New York Bureau of Tourism highly recommend you do whatever the being or beings currently in contact with you are asking, while also um, acknowledging that we have no idea where the missing beings they are referring to is. Please hold for the president. Tavi flicked the bracelet off. What do you want? Tavi asked the alien. I want to know the truth, it said. I see you have an advanced exotic worlds encounter suit. Would you like a real human beer with me? If that helps, it said. You have such a beautiful planet, so unspoiled, paradis paradisiac paradisiac don't know how to say that word. Paradise like. I was swimming with whales in your Pacific Ocean yesterday. Tavi sat down and gave the alien a red stripe. It curled a tentacle around it, pulled it back towards its beak. They watched the trees curling around the LaGuardia debris shiver in the wind, the fluffy clouds ease through the pale blue sky. They deliberately sat with their backs to the section of the sky filled with the destroyer. I've never been to the Pacific, Tavi admitted, just the Caribbean, where my people come from, and the Atlantic. I'm a connoisseur of good oceans, the alien said. These are just some of the best. We used to fish on them. My grandfather owned a boat. Oh, does he still do that? I love fishing. He started chartering it out, Tavi said. The Galactics bought out the restaurants so he couldn't sell to his best markets anymore. They own anything near the best spots and all around the eastern seaboard now. I'm sorry to hear that. About your friend, Tavi took a big swig. They jumped out of my cab when it was in the air. They were in an uh, altered state. There was a long silence. Tavi waited for the world to end, but it didn't. So he continued, and the alien listened as he told his story. And there, and there were no security systems to stop them from jumping? It asked when he finished. There were not, on that cab. Wow, it said. How authentically human. How dangerous. I'll have to audit your account against the confessions of your bureau, but I have to say, I am very relieved. I suspected foul play, and it turns out it was just an utterly authentic, primitive world experience. No door security. Overhead, long, fiery contrails burned through the sky. What's that? Tavi asked, nervous. Independent verification, the alien said. It stood up and jumped down to its cab. It looked closely at the rear doors. I could really just jump out of these, th couldn't I? It turned the door, and Tavi, who had, hoped over the roof, who had hopped over the roof and down the stairs, caught a glimpse of a pale-faced driver inside. Sorry, friend, he thought. There were more shadows descending down out of space, larger and larger vessels moving through the atmosphere far above. What's happening? Tavi asked, mouth dry. News of your world has spread, it said. You are no longer an undiscovered little secret. Finding out that we can die just in a cab ride, where else can you get that danger? The cab lifted off and flew away. Sienna came back out of the shadows. They're over every city now. They're offering ludicrous money for real estate. Tavi looked at the skies. Did you think it would ever stop? She put a hand on his shoulders. Beats them blowing us up, right? They do that sometimes to other worlds that fight it. He shook his head. There's not going to be anything left for us down here, is there? Oh, they'll never want this. She spread her arms and pointed at the miles of space elevator junk. And I still have a new cab, he said. She put a hand on his shoulder. Maybe these new galactics coming down over the cities tip better. And for the first time in days, Tavi laughed. That's always the hope, isn't it? Wow. 
wow, what did you all think of that story? I mean, it's a really interesting sort of perspective of Earth essentially being colonized by aliens and aliens who, I mean, they start out kind of doing it for resources, but it, like Earth is just sort of a novelty to them. Adriel says they loved it. Uh, Bunker Man says the world building is fantastic. Yeah, I really loved how they started layering on the world building. It was very, very cool. Um, gosh, I loved that story. Oh, wow. I wish we could read every story here, but I feel like we, that I think was one of the longer stories. So we might have time for another one of that same length or possibly two. Um, I saw that um, Adriel said wings, which I think was asking for give me your black wings, oh sister. Oh, I recognize this author, Sylvia Marino Garcia. Okay, this is a shorter story, so we'll have time for this one and probably another. All right, we are going to read Give Me Your Black Wings, O Sister by Sylvia Marino Garcia. It's under her skin. It's an electrical current, an itch, a malaise that does not cease. At night, she rubs her hands against her arms and it is there, like pressing your hands on a vein and feeling its gentle thump. A river of emotion surges through her body, an old river. Some ghosts are woven into walls, and others are woven into skin with an unbreakable, invisible thread. You inherit the color of your eyes, but also this thread which chokes you and bites into your heart. If you look back into any family tree, you find paupers and merchants and poets and soldiers, and sometimes you find monsters. During the day, she manages not to think of it. She takes the subway to work. She sits at her desk. She surveys the city from her office window, and she forgets about old phrases, old stories, legends that nobody remembers, washed away by the tide of modernity. But at night, it's still there, under her skin. There are warlocks, and there are witches, who are not what they seem. There are birds that are not birds, and the flapping of wings, and there is hunger, and it comes in the blood. It can skip a generation or two, but it won't be washed away. But it's all in her dreams, all in half-forgotten tales of her childhood, which she brushes away come morning, like brushing away cobwebs. Child eaters. Devourers. She boards the subway and puts on her headphones. The stations go by. There's the blur of people, and she exits the subway card car and walks up the stairs, avoiding vendors and beggars. There's nothing to fear with the cell phone in her hand, the gentle music in her ears, the purse dangling from her shoulder. She phones her mother every Thursday, and they talk for half an hour. And on Fridays, she likes to watch a movie. Saturdays, she goes grocery shopping. There are no curses under fluorescent lights, nor can you find mysteries at the till while you swipe a credit card. The city comforts her like a mother who coddles a child. It says, you are an ordinary body among ordinary bodies. You are, in fact, nobody. She likes that. She just, just like she likes the neon of the signs downtown where nightclubs mushroom and the honking of cars fills the air while the pedestrian crossing urges pedestrians to walk. One day, a man sits next to her on the subway. He wears a suit and his black shoes have just been shined and he has a watch on his right wrist, but she knows immediately he is not a man. She knows that there's something under his skin. She sits rigid with fear, eyeing him from the corner of her eye while he remains immersed in his newspaper. She can smell his cologne, but beneath that there is another scent, the odor of raw meat, meat left under the sun to spoil. It makes her think of the ranch where she spent her summers, of her grandmother chopping off a chicken's head. It makes her think of blood, makes her think of all those stories about the warlocks and the witches who turn into other things and how they fly through the air until they sneak into a child's room and bite into their neck. Blood, 
thick and black like the man's suit. He makes a motion with his hand as if checking the time and raises his head, looking at her and smiling. She can see his teeth, ivory white, old ivory kept in cupboards away from dust, and the smile which is dark, and the eyes which are like gleaming obsidian. I know you, he says. Even if those are not the exact words he says, because she's wearing the headphones, how can she hear him? It is what he means. It's all meaning, all there, like the bones that hide under muscle and flesh, true even if they are out of sight, like the veins and arteries running down her legs, mapping her body, rivers of life which extend far beyond the single body and reach through time. In the stories, there's always a moment when the warlocks and the witches know themselves. And when they do, there is no going back. It's like lighting a match. Such a chemical reaction will not allow the elements to return to their original shape. When they know themselves, they are forever changed. Sister, he says, with conviction that will not be denied. He knows her, knows the atoms in her body and the hidden wings beneath the cage of bones. He knows her like they must all know themselves, gazing at each other in the moonlight with their flesh peeled off and their faces removed. She's scared. She's paralyzed. She does not understand why none of the other passengers seem to notice her distress. Why do they keep looking at their cell phones? Why do they keep chatting? Why do they look down, bored at their scuffed shoes? She feels she will die there sitting in that cramped, stuffy subway car. There, there is the stop. The doors open and the man stands up, holding out his hand to her. He wants her to go with him. Come, he says. Something forbids her from considering such an action. It is the timber of his voice, which is deep and smooth like tar. Or it is the smile, smooth too, and deepening, as if he already knows she'll agree to walk with him. She clutches her purse and closes her eyes. The subway is in motion. When she looks again, he's gone. The seat next to her is empty. She rushes out the subway concourse up the stairs, startling a dozen pigeons which fly up into the darkening sky, and for a moment she holds up her hands as if protecting her face from them, as if they could claw her and puncture her skin with their beaks in an attempt to expose her other inner skin. The pigeons fly off, and she lowers her hands. At home, she turns on all the lights in the apartment, turns on the TV, and does not watch it. She paces until midnight, then slips into bed. She breathes slowly and tries not to think about the way her heart is beating loudly, loudly, loudly in her chest, and the way the blood drifts in her veins, and she bites the inside of her cheek and tells herself there is nothing under the skin. She dreams a different dream that night. It's not a dream, but a memory of long ago, long buried and forgotten, like a child's discarded toys. She is ten years old in the memory. Her grandmother is making chicken stew in the kitchen. There's much plucking and feathers and boiling of water. She feels hungry, and grandmother says the food will be ready soon. It is taking far too long. She should be helping the old woman, but instead she drifts into the nursery. Her baby brother is asleep. She looks at him, gentle and tiny, his breath soft. And then she reaches a hand into the crib. That's it. The end of the memory. The end of the dream. When she wakes up, she is shaken and can hardly look at herself in the mirror. She's afraid of what she'll see. Her brother has been long dead. Crib death. He passed away before reaching his first birthday. She seldom thinks of him. He's not brought up. Once a year, there's a gloomy mass for the child which her mother organizes, like clockwork. She does not normally attend the mass. The last time she went to the church, she recalls her mother's cold stare. Just a look, a few seconds long, a look of loathing. I know what you are, said the look. I know what you did. That look of pure hatred. But there's also love in the look. 
how could there not have been love too? A love that had kept certain secrets or had ignored the truths under the skin. Slowly she gazes in the mirror and lets out her breath. The mirror shows nothing. Her eyes are dark, but not the color of obsidian, and her face is a simple face, just a couple of acne scars left from her teenage years to mar its surface. She applies lipstick and mascara and brushes her hair and steps out of her apartment. The city makes her forget her worries. The large ads on the bus shelters, the guy at the newspaper stand arranging his merchandise, the scent of cigarettes wafting toward her as she walks by a cafe. These details ground her and return her to this ordinary life, this ordinary moment. She sets the purse on her lap, enjoying the presence of the other commuters, their voices in her ears, the movement of the subway car. A woman with a baby sit next, sits next to her. The baby is wrapped in a fluffy yellow blanket, and it gurgles. She looks at it. It's such a pretty little child, like the Christ in a, in a nativity scene, soft like porcelain, this baby at her side. But her mouth salivates, and she feels a terrible hunger, and something stirs under her skin, and she presses her knuckles against her teeth to keep them from chattering. Outside, there's the flapping of wings. Oh my gosh, that story was so like quietly nefarious and unsettling. I'm asking the same question, Bunker Man. Did she eat her brother? Oh, that was really scary. Goodness gracious. Yeah, Flames Rising. That was totally creepy awesome. It's two for two so far. Really amazing stories. Okay. I would love to read something by an uh, AAPI author. Um, so I'm just checking. Okay, this one we probably don't have time for. It's super long. Um, but maybe this one? Wait, wait, wait. Let's see. Oh, no, this one's also really long. Okay. I wish the, the table of contents on my e-reader at least doesn't list the pages, um, which I do wish it did. so that I could uh, determine which story we have some time for. Bum, bum, bum. Scrolling this through some stories to check the length. Mm -hmm. I would also love if there were like, I mean, really, I kind of want to read everything. I, d I definitely am going to go back and read all of these stories just for myself. Um, but I wish that the there was like a, um, notes about which stories were horror stories, which ones are science fiction. I suppose some of them are kind of multiple subgenres of speculative fiction. Dear Dancer. I'm intrigued by this. Okay, this one. It's not the shortest story, so we might go over a little bit, but if folks don't mind. Oh, Adriel says, I love it when anthologies specify or have ratings. Yeah, it would be nice to know, like, I don't know if they necessarily, I mean, content warnings or themes, like just a few words of what the themes are. Um, we might go over a little bit, but folks are welcome to, to stay or go as they're able. Um, and we are going to read uh, the story Dear Dancer by Kathleen Alcala. Ha, she said, jiggling the wrench. I've got you. The pipe came loose with a grating sound and she reached in and unscrewed it the way the rest of the way. Rusty water dribbled out the end as she scuttled from under the house, waving the pipe section in the air. Brownish water splattered her shirt. It felt good. Found it. It'll be an easy fix, she said, wondering if they could find pipe the same diameter and long enough to repair the plumbing. This was the fifth house she'd helped rehab, and Tater was beginning to think of herself as an expert in the underside of houses. Shonda took the pipe from her and fingered the rusty hole. How are you going to find the right size? 
I've got a whole pile from the other houses around here. One of them must have used the same size, maybe even the same plumber in the first place. All these houses were built around the same time. The sun, mother's son, blazed down, and Tater pulled her hat toward, forward from where it hung down in the back on the string. We'd better get home. It was five bells since first light, and unless they planned to spend the rest of the day under the house, they needed to get back. Walking single file, Shonda took the lead, poking any suspicious-looking soil with her walking stick before proceeding. Tater carefully set her feet in Shonda's prints until they came to a place where the houses were lively with people preparing for midday siesta. Chia was just pulling protective burlap sacking back over a patch of taters after digging up a few. The gray nubs did not look like much as they sat steaming on the ground, but washed and sliced into brilliant purple discs, they would glow. Tater's mom had named her after the naturalized Ozettes, brought from Peru by long-ago voyagers. The potatoes had taken to the northwest like, well, no other plant or animal. Tater was proud of her unusual name and secretly hoped she was like them, ordinary at first look, but gem-like on the inside, rooted. Tater was still carrying the pipe. What are you going to do with that? asked Chia. Match it, then recycle. The rest of the pipes held up good. This one is far enough gone. Reuse might be able to smash it into dust for the iron. Tater splashed some water on her neck and hung up her hat. Out of the sun now, she rolled up her sleeves and served herself soup she found cooling on the stove. Chia would stay up cooking so that the day crew would have something to eat when they woke up from their midday slumbers around sundown. Nights worked second shift. It used to be called graveyard shift, but that made too many people sad. Ooh, this next part is in italics, like a poem. What to think when the sun goes down and every light takes on a spectral aspect. My eyes, my eyes, ever deceitful, ever necessary for one who relies on visual cues, who only trusts the stimuli she takes in through the range of light and motion. The angular bounce of light at the solstice, of sun streaming directly into our eyes as though to make up for all the days when we see no sun at all. How our limbs loosen and we tilt back our heads with a slight smile drinking it in. Who can deny the intoxication of sunlight, the touch of gold as it runs down our arms from our fingertips? <clears throat> Our thighs grow slack as our lips part to drink in the pearly heat. Our pen rests on their tables as our minds glide away from the task at hand. Tater read a page in her aunt's diary, then set it aside. She had been given it years before, but had not tried to read it until being assigned to housing rehab. She found it hard to sleep out here on the edges. Reading the old diary helped. She loved imagining what it was like before when the sun was scarce. Tater, Tater liked stroking the soft edges. It was the only book she owned herself, and she found herself fingering the pages like worry beads. Tater lay back carefully in her hammock so as not to flip over, afraid of and grateful for the distance from the floor. Not that rats wouldn't jump or climb up onto the hammock if they felt like it, but Tater still felt better this way. Now she tried to imagine Aunt Cessie's life when water stayed in its place and the sun was a welcome embrace against the damp cold. She could barely remember being cold. Not sleeping? asked Shonda as she came in. Not yet. Shonda unhooked her own hammock from where it hung coiled on the wall and took it outside. She preferred to sleep under the giant dug fir that sheltered their house, a tree they had defended with guns and clubs early on. Tater could smell the taters cooking. There was an herb with them, something she could not quite place as she drifted off to sleep. I'm really liking this sort of like slow dribble of world building. I'm very curious about this sort of sunny dystopia that they live in. Later, af Late afternoons were for domestic chores. That included upkeep on the house where they homesteaded. If they could defend it for seven years, the house was theirs. Most people stayed on wait lists until a house opened up in the center, but that could take forever. Homesteading on the edges offered larger properties, enough to grow food, and also dangers. But even for the edges, there were wait lists of people stacked sky high in mass housing. Tater barely remembered before, and there were some things in between that she could not think about at all. 
Shonda gently shook Tater awake. It felt as though she had just dozed off, a dream of deer picking their way across a clearing fading gently from her mind. Your turn to wash. Tater dragged herself back to the waking world. She might have been having a true dream, but if that's what it was, it would come back. She would need to let the others know if it did. When she was a child of eight, it became clear that Tater got the dreaming. When she was 14, she was given her aunt's journal. Ceci was an original dreamer, born in Mexico, raised in the U.S. in secrecy by her family. Given every advantage to learn the language, the ways of these people, so that she could rescue the rest of her family from the label, them. Everyone in Ceci's family, including Tater's mom, worked every waking moment to keep Ceci the youngest in school and living long enough to pull her family through the torturous knots of the legal system. She succeeded, and her nieces and nephews became U.S. as well. But that was all before. Dream. Salal. Salal. Thimbleberry. Grass. Smell of humans. Water. Stillness. Stillness. Light slanting in for longer days. Humans took their cues from the animals and had become diurnal. Afternoons were for chores, but night was for guarding. Second shift got up and had breakfast with the day shift's dinner. Tater could spot knights on sight. Like her, they had a dreamy look, with large eyes and slightly larger nostrils. There was a lot of talk about whether this was adaptation. After so few generations, or just an affinity for knights of knights for knights as partners, since that's who they got to know anyway. Every household had a combination of days and nights. Tater joined the table next to Anna, one of the few nights she spoke to regularly. Sup? Not too much, just talking about the bears spotted at the north end. Again? They've no fright. Sorrel's pretty sure she heard them talking again. You mean, like, people talk? Yeah, she swears she can almost understand them. Sorrel was at the other end of the table, describing the bear sighting. She stood up and lumbered down the length of the table, stopping to smell each of their plates, setting them laughing. Are the bears changing, or is it just you? Someone called out. Sorrel took her seat. They were eating eggs tonight, gathered from the summer chickens. Could just be me, she said honestly. I've got so I can smell people coming, even tell sometimes who it is. Sorrel flexed her powerful hands and set to her meal. Tater and me are going to need a full crew tomorrow, said Shonda. Five people. Time to replace the roof on the Dennyway house so we can start on the inside. Plumbing's almost done. Tater's fast. Who will you work with next? asked Anna. Tater blushed and looked down. Not for me to say. All in good time, said Chia as she began to clear the table. She might have others don... Do she might have other dons she wants to develop. Tater thought about that. Sometimes she forgot that she could choose what she wanted to work on, who she wanted to work with, as long as it was for the common good. It hadn't been like that before, or even for a while after. Again, she had the strong feeling of the deer in the ravine nearby, and when she looked up, Sorrel had stopped eating and was staring them down the table at her, still and alert. Tater pushed her chair and stood up. I've got to dream now, she said. Shonda pointed at Anna and Chia, who flanked Tater and escorted her out of the kitchen. Tater's team did not have a room set aside just for dreaming. She was the only one in their household, and they all agreed it was a waste of space in their small but ship-shape house. But there was a bed in the main bedroom that was set aside for her. It folded out of the wall to offer a deep, safe space, and a clerestory cast a diffused light in the room during the day. The bed was lowered, and Tater climbed out of her day clothes into a soft woven gown that did not inhibit her movement. That gown of pure cotton from before was probably the most valuable thing the team owned. Tater was humbled by their goodness to her every time she put it on. Anna got a mug of water, and Chia a towel. Sometimes the dreams could be rough, and Tater lost control of her body. By the time they had tucked Tater into bed and settled into chairs on either side of her, she was no longer seeing the room and people around her. It had been a few months since she had last dreamed, and the household was in some ways relieved to see what further instructions they might receive. She could still faintly hear their comforting voices. Dormete, dormete, Anna urged. Sometimes the dream was clear and direct. Other times they could only speculate at what it meant and what they were expected to do with the information. But no one doubted the authenticity of the dreams. Tater was trying to run through the forest. 
There was, this was big forest, not trash trees and overgrown scotch broom. Vines grabbed at her legs as she ran, causing her to stumble. Snatching at a handful of leaves to break her fall, she felt the painful jolt of nettles in the palm of her hand. Tainer gathered all her concentration into her thighs and leaped, now, clear of her human body, bounding without effort through the underbrush. Something was behind her, but she could not see it. The smell was pungent like fire, like chemicals burning a hole in a metal container. Her human thoughts soon fled as she spotted another of her kind and followed, leaping sideways and forwards so as to throw off any pursuers. She crashed through salal and salmonberry, fiddlehead fern, and seeps where freshets rose when it rained. This was the damp country she remembered, the before of her childhood when everyone had enough to eat, clothes to wear, homes to live in, when children went every day to school to learn to live in a world that no longer existed. Tater held the raised sides of the dream bed and rode it like a little boat, rocking and bucking as she moaned and made strange noises. Anna and Chia were there to try to keep her from hurting herself, as she had on occasion, and to take note of anything she might see out loud while in the grip of her dream. They made themselves comfortable and didn't have to say that they were pleased to have finished their dinners ahead of the dream. When Tater woke, it was dark and very quiet. She was alone. She listened to the silence for a few minutes before rising. Climbing out of bed, she walked to the kitchen. A single lamp burned on the table. The dishes lay scattered, some with food still on them, as though abandoned shortly after Tater left. She stepped in something wet and looked down to see a dropped mug. Walking carefully, she returned to the bedroom and climbed back into the dreaming bed. When Tater woke again, it was deep night. And again, she was alone in the house. She listened to the silence for a few minutes before rising. The lantern still burned in the kitchen. Tater took a flashlight and walked out on the porch. The night shift should have been out on the perimeter, making noise, but Tater heard nothing. A strong smell of bear filled her nostrils, and she returned inside to bolt and bar the door. Tater could not tell if she was dreaming or not. This happened sometimes. Her surroundings felt real, but where was everyone? Wouldn't she have heard something if there had been an attack? Wouldn't they have taken her with them, even if she was in the throes of a dream? Tater climbed back into the dream bed once again, just in case. Tater woke a third time, her left hand sticky where it had gripped the raised edge of the bed. When she lifted her hand and opened the palm, it was sticky with blood. Tater woke at ten bells. Chia snored daintily in the chair beside her. Voices came from the kitchen, laughing and the sound of dishes and cooking. Tater pulled on her clothes and folded the gown gently across the coverlet. She awoke and helped return the little bed to the wall. In the kitchen, they agreed with the clatter of dishes being dried. They greet. In the kitchen, they were greeted with the clatter of dishes being dried and stored. Anna sang a high, silly song, and the smell of nettle soup bubbling on the stove filled the kitchen. Sorrel walked up to Tater and reached out. Tater flinched, and Sorrel stopped before gently bringing her hand down on Tater's shoulder. You've got news for us. Tater opened her hand to show Sorrel where the stiffened blood had resolved into the outlines of a map, their own settlement at the center, the edges stretching beyond. They greeted the night with a collective roar. The members of the house were in full regalia, Tater wearing her inherited cocoon rattle leggings. She lifted her canes, one in each hand, and set the tip of each down the way a deer daintily makes its way through the forest. She turned her gaze to this way and that in mimicry of the deer, careful not to lose the antler strapped to her head. The drummer beat a bowl with two sticks turned upside down over a large bowl of water, creating a booming sound that carried for miles. Anna's voice wailed in a des descent. Descant? I don't know that word. The dancers made their way forward and back, forward and back, turning sideways in unison to appear larger to the unseen army. Arise, arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon! Dancers from other houses flanked them, creating a front of noise and light against the outside. Tater felt vulnerable in her soft doe-skin clothing, conscious of how exposed her throat was each time she turned her head, knew that the bandage on her left hand showed she might be wounded. This is how they took back the world, step by step, song by song. At the end of the night, new fence posts would be pounded into place, new fences strung. Tater lifted and set her canes carefully. 
The extra points of support allowed her to keep her feet close together as she pounded the ground with them, directing her energy deep into the earth. Tater realized that if she ever had a daughter, she would name her Ozette. This was new, the consciousness that she might have a future beyond herself. Tater's face shone in the flickering light. It was good to be alive. Oh, that's the end of the story? I want to know more. What exactly is happening at the end? I don't... What did people think? I loved the writing. It was so beautiful. And again, all of these writers are doing such an amazing job of world building and really painting a picture of these possible futures. Um, this story felt a little bit more abstract, though. I don't know if folks in the chat agree with me or not. But look at that. We, were, we only went a minute over. Bunkerman91 says, I appreciate how we don't get all the answers. That gives you a lot to think about after reading a story, which, ooh, ouch, my, my elbow, uh, which I really do appreciate. I loved, loved all three stories that we read. They were all really, really different from each other and yet all so rich uh, with really vibrant worlds that feel so distinct. Flames Rising says, my favorite stories are the ones that leave me with questions to ponder for a while. Yeah, I feel like this is a story which I would also want to just like read again and maybe even a third time because I feel like knowing the end and what's coming, you might pick up on different details as you reread. Anyway, we barely scratched the surface of this anthology. So if you are enjoying it, there are so many other stories uh, that are part of this uh, with so many really talented authors. Uh, so once again, the title of this is New Sons, Original, Original Speculative Fiction by People of Color. If you look up New Sons on Drive Through Fiction, it should pop up in the search bar for you. Oh, I'm actually, I can just like, for folks who are watching right now, I'll drop the link in chat. Um, oh yeah, Adriel was like, what was the title of the whole book again? I have to read all of the stories. Yeah, I loved this so much. I would love to just keep reading this every time I do story time, but you don't, you don't want to give away all the stories, right? Like save some for folks to enjoy on their own. Uh, I can definitely see why this won so many awards just from the uh, amazing stories we read already. This is a really good anthology. Um, so once again, it's available on Drive Through Fiction as an EPUB or a Kindle book. Uh, and it is called New Sons, Original S Speculative Fiction by People of Color. I am going to have to figure out what we read next time. I'm so jazzed for story time. I can't believe it's over. Maybe we'll read Shine, that uh, optimistic science fiction uh, stories. Um, Rebellion Publishing. Seems like they've got some really good anthologies, so check them out. Let's see. Next week, we'll be back same time, same place. Um, Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 10, 11, 12, 1 Eastern on twitch.tv slash one bookshelf. And it'll be DMs Guild Community Jam. Last, last, last month, I tried to do a jam all about monster design uh, and uh, my power went out. Surprise. So it got cut off pretty close to the beginning. So we're going to do it for real this time. So I hope you join again next week. Thank you very much for joining me for story time this time. I really hope you enjoyed this anthology as much as I did. Um, but yeah, uh, take care everybody. And thanks for joining me for your lunch break. Bye everyone.